Hi, this is Vanessa, and here is ASEAN News for today's episode. President Zeram Zorta meets Indonesia counterpart to strengthen bilateral ties. Estimate President Jose Ramos Horta says during a visit to Indonesia, he hopes to boost trade ties between the countries and seal a decades long bid by his nation to join ASEAN next year. Ramos Horta meets his counterpart, Joko Widodo, on his first state visit to neighboring Indonesia since he was elected in April for a second stint as president. I am very grateful that uh, Indonesia remains very committed to Timor-Leste membership in uh, ASEAN uh, as uh, very normal. Uh, Timor-Leste is part of Southeast Asia. We have uh, fulfilled many, many of the requirements necessary for a functioning economy, a functioning democracy. So Timor-Leste will be a productive member of ASEAN. So we hope to join ASEAN by the, during Indonesian presidency. The head state of Indonesia says during a meeting they focus discussion on bilateral cooperation, friendly, openly and strength economic cooperation. It is an honor to receive the first overseas state visit of Ramos Horta. We were talking about our bilateral cooperation, friendly and openly. The commitment towards strengthening economic cooperation was the main focus of our discussion. First, we are agreed to keep increasing trade between the two countries by looking at the trend of trade development, which is looking positive. I'm sure trade between the two countries can be upgraded. Ramos Horta previously served as the president of East Timor, which is also known as Timor Leste, between 2007 and 2012. East Timor, which applied for ASEAN membership in 2011, currently holds observer status. Speaking at the presidential palace in Bogor, south of Jakarta, the Indonesian president said his country has invested $818 million in East Timor, mainly in energy, banking and communication business. Official Indonesia data shows trade between the countries was worth around $250 million last year. Malaysia and China reach five-point consensus on developing ties. Visiting Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi says in Kuala Lumpur, China and Malaysia have reached a five-point consensus on further developing their relations. At a joint press conference with Malaysian Foreign Minister Saifuddin Abdullah, after their meeting, Wang says China-Malaysia ties are witnessing new opportunities for development. China is ready to work with Malaysia to set new goals and priorities for bilateral relations so as to elevate their ties to a new high, noting that both sides have reached a series of important consensus. Second, China and Malaysia have agreed to jointly build the Belt and Road with high quality and implement the Global Development Initiative. They will take the 10th anniversary of the two countries' twin parks initiative as an opportunity to establish a pioneer zone for trade and economic innovative development and a demonstration zone for industrial capacity of belt and road cooperation. China is willing to import more quality agricultural products from Malaysia and help international students from Malaysia return to China to resume their studies. China is ready to work with its ASEAN partners, including Malaysia, to deepen their strategic mutual trust and strengthen strategic coordination as to maintain regional stability and work for common development. Wong wrapped up his Asia tour, which has taken him to Myanmar, Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia. G20 financial leaders meet in Bali under the cloud of war in Ukraine.
Indonesian Finance Minister Sri Mulyani Indrawati says G20 finance leaders to reach a consensus during talks in Bali, warning otherwise it could be challenging for low-income countries facing soaring food and energy prices. Finance leaders from the group of 20 major economies are meeting on the resort island as host Indonesia tries to find common ground in a group frayed by the Ukraine war and rising economic pressures from soaring inflation. So the triple threat of war, surging commodity prices and increased global inflation that can also increase and creating a real spillover to debt, not only for the low income countries, but also in the middle income countries or even advanced economy. We are starting before pandemic and then because of pandemic as already using our fiscal space that have the implication of increasing debt position. And now, with this triple threat, this is going to be even more a very dire complex to be managed. So I'm sure G20 members include Western countries that have imposed sanctions on Russia and accuse it of war crimes in Ukraine, which it denies as well as nations like China, India and South Africa, which have been more muted in their responses. Sri Mulyani calls for G20 members to talk less about politics and build bridges between each other to deliver more technical decisions and action. Indonesia says Ukraine's finance minister is expected to speak at one of the sessions virtually. Russian finance minister Anton Siluanov will also address the meeting virtually, with his deputy traveling to Bali. Janet Yellen urges the G20 to take action to address the short-term food security crisis. The United States Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says that when speaking in seminar on food insecurity in Bali, Indonesia, she urges a group of 20 major economies to take urgent action to address a short-term food insecurity crisis exacerbated by Russia's war in Ukraine and avoid market distorting export restrictions and stockpiling. We must take action to address the short-term food insecurity crisis and, equally important, the longer-term drivers of food insecurity, including the nexus with climate change. The speed and wisdom of our decisions now will make the difference on whether we get the crisis under control. We don't need new institutions. What we need is robust coordination knowledge sharing, research and development, financing and action. In this respect, the Global Alliance for Food Security is helpful. And I further propose that G20 deputies consider how to enhance cooperation between G20 finance ministries and the relevant other authorities, including by improving data transparency. Yellen speaking at a meeting of G20 finance officials in Indonesia says countries should target fiscal support measures to help those most in need rather than adopting costly and regressive blanket subsidies. She also calls on G20 members to boost their spending to address existing food security challenges linked to conflict, climate change and economic shocks from the COVID-19 pandemic that had grown worse due to war-related increase in food, fertilizer and fuel prices. Our situation here in 2022 is going to be projected to be deteriorated further. And this is not good news for all of us. The unresolved COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the unfolding war in Ukraine, are likely to exacerbate the already severe 2022 acute food insecurity that we are all already seeing. In addition to that, a looming fertilizer crisis also has the potential to further exacerbate and extend food crisis even into 2023 and beyond. In the same event, Indonesian Finance Minister Sri Mulyani Indrawati calls for a joint forum involving G20 Finance and Agriculture Ministries to come up with concrete action to tackle growing food insecurity and a looming fertilizer supply crisis. Food insecurity is one of the top issues on the agenda at the G20 meeting of finance leaders in Bali.
where host Indonesia has been trying to find common ground in a group rattled by Ukraine war and rising economic pressures from soaring inflation. China welcomes practical cooperation in Asia-Pacific region, but not confrontation. China welcomes practical cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region that is conductive to peace, stability, development and prosperity, but rejects confrontation, formation of all small circles and a new Cold War. Chinese and foreign minister officials have said in commenting on the latest diplomatic offensive launched by the United States in the Asia-Pacific region in efforts to contain China. China officials say the Lanchang Mekong cooperation mechanism has become a golden model of regional cooperation. Wang Yi also delivered a speech at the Secretariat of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations stressing that China is willing to work with ASEAN to promote open regionalism. What ASEAN country need is open, inclusive, heart-to-heart, -heart, mutually beneficial and practical cooperation, rather than small circles, a new Cold War, forced decoupling or disconnection as carried out by some countries. China and ASEAN are each other's largest trading partners, with a bilateral trade volume 100 times that of 30 years ago. The China-Laos Railway has successfully opened to traffic and a number of belt and road projects have been launched, with great achievements reported one after another. All these facts demonstrate the cooperation between China and ASEAN countries is practical and mutually beneficial. To deepen cooperation between China and other countries in the Asia-Pacific, Wang Yi has conducted a series of diplomatic activities in the region since the beginning of this month, visiting Myanmar, Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia, and sharing bilateral meetings with Vietnam and Cambodia respectively in Anning City of South China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. On July 4, the Foreign Minister of China, Myanmar, Laos and Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam gathered in Myanmar for the 7th Lanchang Mekong Cooperation Foreign Minister's Meeting. Effective to the signatories as of January 1, 2022, the RCEP compromises 10 ASEAN member states, namely Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, together with their five free trade partners, which are China, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand. New United States Ambassador in South Korea participates in LGBT festival. Thousands of South Korea take part in LGBT festival in downtown Seoul with a new United States ambassador to South Korea taken to the stage in support as conservative groups rallied in protest across the street. To express the strong commitment of the United States to ending discrimination wherever it occurs and to ensuring that everyone is treated with respect and humanity. We're going to fight with you for equality and human rights. Thank you. Wearing rainbow masks and waving flags, participants browse some 72 booths set up by human rights groups, university LGBT clubs, embassies, religious and progressive organizations, taking part in face painting or social media events. Local media reports around 13,000 people had participated in the Seoul Queer Culture Festival by the afternoon. Due to the COVID-19 over the past three years, I couldn't go to many offline events, and it was even harder due to the stigma and unfair attacks on LGBT communities. But it's so nice to see people laugh and enjoy again. According to the Yonhap News Agency, across the road from the festival taking place in Seoul Plaza, in front of the City Hall, protesters held a rally gathering at least 15,000 people. They say they feel obliged to protect healthy sexual ethics for children and condemned the ambassador for participating. Police stand by to watch out for potential tension between the two groups. Well, that's the news for today. We will see you soon.